Okay, this is the final part of this room. There's another talk after this in the other room. And today we'll um, have a presentation. Oh, uh, my name is Mike Martin, first of all, we'll start with that. I'm a faculty member here at Centre College. This talk is about ubiquitous system analysis with performance co-pilot. And uh, we have two speakers, Luke Bird and Abigail Jackson. Uh, so this is a software engineer at Red Hat. Um, he is a performance tools engineer, contributing to System Tap since 2010. His work has included enabling System Tap to natively probe Java programs, as well as adding performance API metrics to performance copilot. Abigail is an intern at Red Hat for the 2014 to 2015 term, working on System Tap. Her contributions to System Tap vary between front end language features and optimization. So please join me in welcoming uh, Lucas and Abigail. Thank you, Mike, for the introduction. So, like you mentioned, my name is Lucas. Uh, I'm an intern or engineer now on the performance coding team. And, uh, we're talking to you about Performance Copilot, and it's a toolkit which will allow you to very easily grab metrics from the entire system. Um, and we'll dive into it. So we'll have a uh, introduction outline for those of you who don't know the different components throughout Performance Copilot, and some of the recent developments that are going on, and how they actually fit in the Performance Copilot. So hopefully you can see, if you have interest in it, So, analyzing performance, how do you usually do this, right, on the various blocks? Um, you know, first thing you might look at is the various logging forms, so R, syslog, syslog, next generation, journal D, all of the pros and cons, uh, maybe you don't like binary formatting, but it's very much after the fact. Um, you've got your sys tools, right? Um, IOTOP, VMSTAT, uh, you know, they're great tools, but they're not very flexible, right? They're profiling, they'll tell you what they're designed to tell you, if you want to think more of it or to change how they present it to you, it's not very useful. Um, realistically, especially with DevOps and SysOps, there's a mixture of scripting languages, right? Bash, Perl, what have you. And those are more of a black magic than a science, right? They're not easily reproducible. And you might pass down a script to another engineer, but they might never use it. And yeah, realistically, specific tools vary per platform. Um, I would love for Linux to be everywhere. But realistically, it's not. You've got users perhaps using a Windows box, if you ever heard of that, or a Mac OS. And it's a heterogeneous environment. Uh, yeah, so proper analysis requires more context than a lot of what the traditional tools allow you to do. So introducing Performance Copilot. A few points of interest for you. Um, it's a toolkit, right? It applies the old standard of do one thing and do it well. And you'll see that throughout the uh, overview of it. And it complements existing system functionality. And this is a big one, because you'll never get a systems administrator running away faster than telling them, you're going to have to relearn this. That just, this is not going to happen. So we're very gentle in applying, you know, letting you apply what you want, where you want. And it's cross-platform. Um, it originally ran on IRIX, so SGI, or SGI, sorry. Um, and but it runs on Linux, Windows, Mac OS, uh, BSDs. Uh, we ensure that it maintains that ability. And there's consistent unit measurement throughout the toolkit. Uh, if you just have the number spitting out at you, that doesn't mean anything, right? You need to know, is it kilobytes a second? Is it gigabytes a minute? Uh, let's have some context. And it's extremely extensible. This is something I'm going to point out in multiple points during the presentation and how you can extend it. And it's open source. A um, bit of background, it actually wasn't originally open source. SGI open sourced it after they developed it after about 10 years. Uh, so it's a great example of how a project can become open source and still successful at it. And SGI, I mean, an old supercomputer company, when they were originally designing this, they kept the, the fact that it's going to be running on high performance computers in mind and designed the data structures to complement that. So, on any given performance copilot setup, you're going to have two underlying components. You have the performance metric domain agent, that's a mouthful, but 
that's what actually talks to what you're interested in. So say you're interested in memory statistics, you're going to have one of those guys for memory statistics, one for the network, right? So it's very specific. And on one machine, you're going to have, uh, sorry, only one of the performance metric collection data. And that's what knows how to talk to the agents, right? There's only ever going to be one, and there going to be n of the agents. But we're going to simplify that. It's simply going to be the agents and the PMCD. Right? A lot easier to say, especially for me. Um, so this is what any given machine might look like, right? Once again, uh, n to 1, one PMCD, and then all the various agents you have installed. Uh, and I left down application specific because we know what's important for you to measure. We might not have knowledge of that. We don't know what program you're writing. So that's where you fit. So just out of curiosity, right, how many number or how many metrics are exposed by default? Well, there's a lot. On my default Fedora install, I have about 1,500 different metrics. Uh, so that presents some unique challenges, right? If you have so many different things you can measure, how do you categorize them, right? And there's a huge variation. Some might be time statistics, some might be the volume. Uh, yeah, this doesn't all fit nicely into one thing. Um, so how do you reliably and predictably name them? I want one user to know what they're measuring and it makes sense to the next user or the next system then. Uh, it all needs to work together. So our answer to that is the performance metric namespace. And it's a hierarchical naming scheme, right? You start with the subsystem and work your way down to the more specific part of the metric. As an example, because this might look like a you know, full slide, but if I was interested in looking at the number of packets I've received on the network, on the TCP protocol, I would say the metric name is network.tcp.receipt packet. Right? Fairly simple and straightforward. You can do things like syscalls per CPU, right? You know it's kernel.perCPU.syscall. Okay? So that's all, it all fits together from a naming perspective. So how do you make use of all this? Uh, we're going to come back to this diagram several times, but on the flip side of things, right, you've got agents, PMCD, and you're going to have these tools, various tools, that all do different things. Again, Unix-like component design. All these tools present data to you in a different way that you, that you want to see it. So PM Battle will look at the current value of statistic, PM Find is a tool that can find machines on your network that are running performance profiler. Uh, PM info will tell you more about a value. And all this can be done over a network. So these tools do not have to run on the same machine that you're running as PMCD. It allows you know, ubiquitous gathering of information all of your systems. Right? So where would you start? Uh, well, one place to start would be the tool called PM info. And it simply displays information about the metric area. So let's say I say PM info dash T. All that's going to do is spit out the metric name and a short bit of help text and describe that metric. Uh, by default, right, 1,500 metrics is going to display a lot. So what you can do is you can narrow it down for subsystem. So say if you were to do PM info dash D PAPI, you get a list of all the PAPI metrics plus that you know small one line bit of help text. All right, so you can quickly see ref sick is ref with cycles. So I've got this metric I'm interested in, what now? Uh, well, PM Val, another tool back in the chart, will display the current value of the metric. So say I want the total six, whatever the metric is called. And one thing I do want to point out before I display the output is, notice I'm running the pseudo. We do respect access control lists. There are metrics on your machine that might be sensitive. We will respect that and we'll let you know, proper users access those values. So I enter this, hit enter, and you get the metadata of it, right? You get the metric name, sure, what host it's running on. Again, this is throughout the entire network. Um, and how it's going to be presented to you, right? So in this case, it's a column of counter, and it's just going to convert to a rate per second. You can change that sampling rate uh, through different uh, flags that you set, but this is by default. And simply once a second, it's going to type out, well, this is the rate it's changing. Let's keep going. So cool, you, you know, basic starting point. I'm going to focus on one tool now called PM Logger, just to give you a brief overview. Like I mentioned before, logging is useful, right? It's been used for ages. And so this tool, all it does is take a specific set of metrics you're interested in, and be in a different host that's really easy to set up, and it spits out archives. 
um, we'll log them for you. And what that will do is you can then feed these archives into tools and it'll treat them like live data so you can historically look at things. Right? Uh, so yeah, basically PM logger creates logs for future analysis. Uh, it's important to be able to look back on what happened, especially if say your system went down, what was the current state of the system before it happened? A lot of times you don't hit failure points, it's simply things slow down. Um, and by default, that's a question I get all the time, how much space does it take up, right? How much, how much utilization are you using? Um, and the answer is about five megabytes a day, you rotate and press for you. But you know, if you do want to log more, it might take up more. Um, and it's organized, right? I hear some of horror stories of people grabbing a whole bunch of metrics from their systems. They have no way to organize it. They stuff it into Elasticsearch so they can search for it later. And then they turn around and say, man, I've got these disk usage issues where I got, I'm going to buy new hardware. We don't want to have that problem for you. It's, it's easy to organize. It's easy to look up. So a few recent developments and future developments we're working on. And we're going to explain how these fit back into performance copilot. We're very gentle. Uh, we have a Pappy PMDA. PM Web B and enabling this steeper system introspection. I'm just going to leave this quote up there so I don't read through it. So, I, I'm sorry, I don't know who originally said that. I hate putting quotes up and are uncredited. But the important, I mean, joke aside, cache and validation is an issue that people encounter on a system, right? It'll affect your performance in, in some cases uh, quite significantly. So this is where Pappy comes into play. It's a performance API, right? So it's cross-platform, again, which is important for performance co-pilot. And it uses the dedicated hardware on your machine um, that looks at performance metrics, right? So every machine has them. More recent processes are a bit better about it. Um, and it measures things like you know, cache hits or misses, uh, jumps taken, uh, total instructions, right? So very low-level stuff. And by simply writing an agent for it, we're able to take those metrics and display it for the entire system, right? Instead of writing this into your C program, you can just take a look across the system from a performance profile. So how does it fit in? Again, we bounce back to this chart. Instead of being application specific, it's simply happy. So we could just use the raw values. We've written this agent now. We can extract the values. And you can do something as simple, right, like we did just before, where it's going to spit open the metadata and give you a couple values. But realistically, um, ratios and relative percentages with stuff like this is more important. And when you have a running terminal with one number, another running terminal with another, I would hate, I mean, I'm a programmer. I'm lazy. I don't want to try and grab one number, highlight it, enter into my calculator, grab another one that looks close, enter that in my calculator, and go, oh, I got 2% cash miss. That's, that's ridiculous. Um, so this is a perfect tool for PMI. So again, we do that all our tools. So now we want to display this properly, and we're going to use PMI to do it. Now PMI is a performance metrics inference engine. It allows you to form metric-based expressions for evaluation. So taking the tool, sits, uh, let's say take total instructions, right? And you can compare that to say total I don't know, cash misses on the third level. You can compare those two metric values. And you compare them using ratios, scanless aggregates, right? So it's only a little scripting language in a way. And you can run events based on what you see, right? So you can raise alarms, run shell commands, log it. And again, you can run this on live or archive data. So let's say you've got a system set up when something's failed. You can proactively then, or retroactively, I should say, look at what happened, write a rule to describe it, and let's say your database, you Put a little back up and something didn't occur. You can write a script to map that, check that it works, and then install it to your live system. So you have verification. And right, we can run rules across multiple hosts. Again, this is all across your network. So let's take a look at a sample expression. If you look at some of Intel's um, performance tooling guides, like I mentioned before, total instructions as a percentage with uh, cache misses can be something of interest. So let's start with that. Level three cache miss as a percentage for divided by total instructions on the system. Now that's not useful. You want to turn that into percentage. So you just times by 100, right? That's basically the rhythm of it. Then you need to decide what percentage am I concerned about? Well, for an arbitrary value, I'll say 2%, right? 
then we add some ints, which is PMA's case of saying some instance or if. So if this percentage is greater than 2%, then what do you want to do? Well, I'm just going to log something. Percentage of level 3 cash is greater than 2%. Right, you can take action on what occurs, or just log it whatever you want to do. That's a simple uh, rule, right? So, moving on to PM of D. Uh, we already ship a GUI tool, tool, right? It's uh, based on QT, but maybe you don't want to use that for whatever reason. Like, I like it, but if you want to use your tool and present it to you in your way, let's be flexible. Uh, and there are two tools, uh, Graphite and Grafana, and you know, they're pretty featureful, let's let you use them. PCP's architecture and design makes it easy, right? Relatively easy. So again, this is how we're going to fit into it. With the PM tools, the PMCD, and then we write a tool that will display the information to Graphite or Grafana in a proper way. Right? This is simply presenting metrics in an easy to use way. And we're going to ship them into a unmodified version of Grafana and Grafana. And by doing that, you get something that looks like this. Some little pretty lines. Um, but I mean, right, right away you can see overall trends. So on, let's see, June 13th, you got a spike in the uh, total load for the kernel. And with Grafana, you can zoom in, highlight what's interesting to you, add more bars of data. And at the bottom, like, look, you've got the axis measured. And both the percentage and the time. Uh, the bottom bar is just uh, bytes going across the network. Uh, so you can see when someone did, they could get a poll or something. Uh, on the flip side of things, you can use Graphite. So Graphite will present to you as archives, like we mentioned before. And you simply open those up, navigate your way down the performance of metrics tree, and you highlight the metric you're interested in. So this is the number of kernel users logged on. And you can see the overall flow of information. So cool. I mean, without rewriting a huge tool, we're able to present information to you logically. And the thing is, Helix Copilot offers a really wide uh, variety of metrics, uh, which is great. But what happens in the case we want to go deeper, right? We want more information about the program, maybe. Uh, what's a bit intrusive? Uh, we need a system wide tool of live data help. Simple message that says the bash process has started. 
Looking at something a little bit more complicated, we can try and list out the functions in the order that a process calls them. So in this case, our pro point will be the process bash, and we'll let, let the function be a wild card so that we can just track any function that uh, gets called. And we'll actually specify that we want it to be when the function is called by using dot call. And then within the handler, we'll try and print out what function got called. We'll do that by using ppfunk, which is a helper function, and I'll explain that later. And I'll basically write out what the pro point function is. So actually running the script, this is the kind of output you can get. So now that you've seen a couple of examples, where do you actually get started? Like where I usually start is I figure out what you can pro. So if you don't actually know what you can probe, you can look at what type of probe points there are, and you can use that by um, executing staff dump probes. So just a basic example, you have Java probes, kernel probes, uh, module probes, process probes, and so on and so forth. Uh, so within the handler, you can, system path has ordinary features that you find in any language. So you have your globals, locals, strings, integers, so on and so forth, which shows. We also have additional handy features like associative arrays, for each loops, aggregates, macros, and regex matching. So now that you know the pro point types that you have, how do you actually get started writing a script? So for this, we'll use listing mode. And listing mode will basically list out the possible pro point types. Or pro point, sorry. Uh, so to do so, you just use stat dash L, and you'll give an example pro point. Pro, yeah, pro point. So in this case, we'll just take the process stat, and we'll look at any function with that start with symbol underscore. So running this, we'll, do, we'll get this kind of output. You can see that there are two different pro points that we can use. Within system tab, you also have context variables, and probes can access these context variables. So you can actually list them using slash, uh, dash capital L, which is slightly different from lowercase. And so in this case, we'll look at kprocess.create. And you'll actually see that kprocess.create is there, and it'll also show up a whole bunch of different context variables like return, clone flag and a whole bunch of helper variables in there. You can also see that the context variables are the ones that start with the dollar sign. Tap sets are basically the library for system tap groups. Their main purpose is to provide a level of, of abstraction so that the user doesn't have to know the exact details of what they're trying to do. So, for example, we can look at kprocess.create. And what it actually is, is the pro point kernel.function copy process.return. And that's kind of a mouthful, kind of hard to remember. Whereas if you look at kprocess.create, it's something simple, something that you can easily figure out. So kprocess.create is actually an alias for kernel.function, blah, blah, blah. And you'll actually see that you can actually list all the alias probes by using staff.probe alias. Within tab sets, we also have helper functions. And uh, to look at an example, you can, we'll use kprocess.create as the probe point type, probe point sorry, and within the handler, we'll try and print out what process is started. So kprocess.create actually has a variable new PID but just printing out a PID is never really helpful. So what we'll use is a helper function PID to exec name, and it will convert the new PID into what the process name is. And so running this uh, script, we will get this kind of output. For a list of the available helper functions and tab sets, you can just use that probe function. Along with the helper functions, we have helper variables. So we'll give an example again. Um, we'll look at what all the system calls that you can have. And within the handler, we can just print out what 
the name of the syscall was and what the parameters were. So in this case, name and harms are both helper function, helper variables. Harms is actually special, or used in this case, it's actually special because we have encased it with other signs on both sides, both sides, and that will basically print out the parameters in a nice format for us. So writing this script, we will get this kind of output. And as you can see, the helper functions are really useful because you don't actually need to know what, in this case, what the parameter names are and how many parameters there are. So in the first line, you'll see there's only three parameters. In the last line, there's at least six. So we've looked at what a couple profile types are, what you can stick in help um, your handlers, but how do you really tie that in together into something that's more useful? So as I mentioned, it's kind of system tap can be used as a debugger, but it's a little bit more than that. You can actually like help fix your problems that you found. So looking at an example, we'll have something like this, uh, this program. And what it basically does is it will so while we execute 10 times, it will sleep for second each time and then print out a message yeah, after sleeping. After it's iterated 10 times, it'll just say 10 seconds to pass and exit the program. Really simple. So executing this uh, program, you, you get this kind of output. And if you have time to read it, that's the 10th line over there. And it hasn't actually stopped, which it should have. So getting some kind of program like this, you want to figure out what's wrong. Like this is a simple example, and it doesn't have much of a body. You already see the source code. The source code is small. It doesn't really do much. But this kind of thought process can really apply to larger scale programs where you the source code is just large. There's so much to read. There's so much to look at. There's so much to just understand with it. So system type can really help with that. And so going through this thought process, we can think about where do you start probing? Where do you start figuring out where problems might occur? And if we take the route of looking at functions specifically, we can think about, well, does function x ever call function y? And if it does, with what parameters? Like what's, what are the arguments being passed in and what are the, what are the arguments being returned? And then, at the end, once you've figured out what the problem might be, you can think about what can what can you do to fix it. So starting with where to probe, again, listing mode is really useful. In this case, we just list what functions there are. We know what functions there are, there's a name and there's sleeper. So thinking about what functions call what, we can consider does main ever call sleeper. Again, we see that we knew what the source code was. We knew that main called sleeper. Um, so to do so, just to show how you can figure out what functions might actually call, you can use this kind of example where, again, you're using listing mode. And you're specifying the process as terminator, the function is main. And you're also using a call lead. And call lead is basically the function that's being called by main. And in this case, we'll leave it as a while functions are, the functions are being called. So this is the kind of output that you get. And if you notice, we also have a context variable that we can use, and that's not. So that was really just a starting point, figuring out where the problem might be, like, what to look at, um, what you can see within the system tap. So moving on from that, what, how do you determine where, when the loop ends? And from that, what about the return value from sleeper? So we can write a script that will basically um, show us what the return value from sleeper is going to be, which really determines when the loop ends. So starting with a variable old num, we'll just set it to negative one for the time being. And within our probe that we want to use, we'll specify the event to be terminator, process terminator, function sleeper, and when that function returns. So within that, we'll just check if the current 
current num that's being returned from sleeper is going to be less than or equal to the old num that we had before. If so, we're just going to write an error saying that num is not increasing and we found a problem. Otherwise, we'll just move on in any way. So actually running this script, we'll use system tap, uh, we'll use the dash c flag to specify that we want the program dot termi terminator to only, um, sorry, we use the dash c flag to specify that we want the script to only run for as long as terminator is running for. And it'll also actually start process terminator. So running the script, this is the output we get, and we can see there was an error. No, it's not increasing. So we found a problem. So now that we know what's actually wrong with it, how can we fix the problem that we have? Again, looking at the source code, typical solution would just be num plus plus somewhere in the easy fix. But what happens if this is, like this example is really simple, but what happens if you're actually looking at something that's larger, something that's not going to be stopped. So what can you really do at that point? Well, our alternative is to write a system tap script to do that increase for us. In this case, um, we'll again start with a global so that we can keep track of what the actual number is supposed to be. From that, we'll write the probe and it'll be processed Terminator function sleeper and we'll check when it returns. Um, we'll look at if we want, if the num is actually less than or equal to what the actual num is supposed to be, and if so, we'll increase actual num and then set that to the return value of what's to the return value of sleeper. So that this way in the main it'll know that uh, it'll have the actual num. If not, if uh, num is actually increasing like it should be, then we'll leave it on its merry way. So the result from running that script, um, we'll, write, we'll use the dash g flag to basically specify guru mode. And in guru mode, it basically tells the syntax that you know you're changing the context variable. Well, sorry, in this case, it's basically saying that you know that you're changing a context variable and that you are sure that it's okay and that everything is fine and the system task will let you do so. So running the script, this is the kind of output that you'll get and you can see that it works. Cool. Thanks, Abby. So hopefully there are two takeaways from this. Uh, one, when there's the impending Terminator apocalypse, use system tap. Um, and two, that's the type of information we want to get involved with PCP, um, and it fits the bill. So how do we make use of this information? Um, you know, it's got malleable output, um, and you were able to very, uh, specify various probe points, right? Depending on what you want to see, depending on, let's say, network latency, we can specify that in system tap. This is great. Uh, some things like perf, you might not be able to get that information or change the output. Um, and it exposes low-level information safely, right? That's a big thing. We don't want to you know, have users risk losing information or something like that. So how this would fit in, right? Again, instead of Pappy this time, we're going to say System Tap. Um, so as the example, and now this is what we've been currently working on. This is still in dev. So one question we asked ourselves was, how can we determine the network latency on a network device? That information isn't typically available through you know, various means. So what we did is we have this PMDA that we've specially written, and we're going to have the output kernel module from system tap. And the trick here is to get the system that kernel module to spit into the PMDA or the agent correctly, right? That's how it's all going to fit together. And by writing a special system tap script and formatting it properly, right, we're hoping to get this more programmable in the future. Uh, we had an engineer write a script that you'd specify the uh, network devices he was interested in, dev1 and dev2 are totalized, and Ethernet actually exists. He runs the script, and then in a different terminal, uh, he ran pminfo-fd stat json. And this is all still moving parts, but the JSON is actually really nifty because there are other tools that use JSON to communicate, like statsd. This could potentially be used for something like that too, so it's still variable input. And if you look at the output, 
Dev 1, Dev 2, nothing, but the value of the uh, transmit latency is 319. We're still working on things like the units. I know that's very important. Um, and the transmit count is valued at, you know, what, 2 million and change? Right, so these are the type of low level information that, sorry, that sounds good, uh, type of low level information that we're interested in. So hopefully this has given you a couple examples on how you can get you the information you want out of various applications and display it to you correctly. Thanks very much. Any questions? No? Um, hopefully you can contribute. This is where you'll uh, find us. Feel free to pass us. And, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, so this, can this be used for just like uh, home PCs? Oh, yeah. Check for just stats? Yeah, absolutely. We actually had a contributor online who fed information in from various home automation, home automation systems um, and fed it into PCP. So then he turned around his browser and saw the information. So. Anything else? Yeah. Where, where do these tools uh, stand with respect to support for uh, non-X86 architectures and specifically uh, ARM32 and ARM64? Uh, well, it's a variety of architectures. ARM64 particular, I think we should be fine. Yeah, you know, we should get your name. Sorry, my name's Dave Broly. I'm also a Red Hat and I'm also a PCB developer. Um, those particular hardware architectures I would have to go back to you at. And if you wanted a full list of platforms, we can also do that. But it's quite expensive and some of them are very old and we take pride in just keeping it working at where it's ever worked. It struck me that when, especially you're talking about cache misses and so forth, that the collection mechanism for some of like instruction counts and so on must be must be very architecture specific to, to get that information. Some of them yeah. are, yes. Um, for example, one one agent is called Linux, and it's the one that collects Linux kernel metrics. And for every platform, there will probably be the equivalent of that particular agent. Um, we try to write them as portably as possible, but uh, you know, some things just aren't that way. Every system is different, and that has different metrics to collect. Yeah. So if you want to either contact us or leave us your contact information, we'd be happy to get you that full list. Um, I just don't want to say yes without really being sure. Yeah. What's the complexity like to write a, a standalone, uh, you know, a, agent? Agent. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it varies depending on what you're trying to do. We have beginner uh, programming guides and introduction tools. Uh, do you write in Python, Perl, or C? Yeah, sure. Yeah, you can do them all. So whatever you're comfortable with. Okay. Yeah, you can write agents in Python. Yeah. Like I said, those, those different languages. And there's actually uh, a uh, skeleton agent that you can use as a starting point. The so right agents have to follow certain protocols and rules. Um, and if you start with the, with the uh, skeleton, you know, be like most of the way there before you even start. There's also an agent, a sample agent, which you can take a look at. And well, there's nothing else. Thanks very much. Yeah, oh, sure. Um, what's the documentation like for the computer? Extensive. Um, so one manual in particular I'd encourage you to look at was the PCP intro guide. It's online as well in PDF form. Um, and it comes both, there's a systems programmer version and a user administrator guide. So it depends what angle you're coming at. Yeah, there's also uh, man pages describing the complete API uh, because uh, you know the metric namespace represents an API and how you access it represents an API if you want to write a tool. And on the other side is the uh, protocol for the agents to follow it also represents an API. Uh, so that's actually full, just fully described in the man pages that get installed, but also on the on the uh, website we call them the books. There's uh, the programmer's guide that describes all of that, and there's also a sysadmin guide which is tailored more to a sysadmin using existing uh, components to set up whatever he wants to monitor. Cool. Well, thanks very much, everybody, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Can you move this, uh
Abby, I'd just like to uh, give you just a small couple of things. Thanks very much. I talk really quickly, you gave me five, five minutes, I'm like, I'm already. <laughs> <laughs>